Hey, basketball fans, welcome to another edition of Around the Rim, your favorite WNBA show hosted by your girl, Tarika Foster Brasby, and my girl, LaChina Robinson. Um, it has been a great week in women's basketball as usual, but we are nearing the end of the season. And this is around the time where we are starting to look at uh, end of the season awards, who is in the running for MVP, Defensive Player of the Year, Coach of the Year, Most Improved Player in six woman of the year as well as rookie of the year and so today um LaChina and I are gonna not only discuss it but we don't have a little bit of a disagreement because um someone likes to stalk my Twitter and we weren't disagreeing go ahead sometimes, sometimes we say things and you know I know that China has a history of saying some wild and crazy stuff sometimes, but every once in a while, Tarika throws out some wild and crazy stuff sometimes too. And one of the things that we basically um, kind of conflicted on a little bit was who was in the MVP race in terms no. of the conversation. Who no, no, no. The, yes, it was. We did not disagree yes, on who was in the conversation. I told you that you had to limit the number of people that were in okay. this conversation. That's, that's where we, okay, that's go fair. ahead. I'm going to let you fair. finish. I'm gonna okay, let you finish. so that's fair. So today I would like to set the record straight um, in terms of the 2022 WNBA MVP conversation around the rim style. Okay. So before we get deep into this first, I think it's fair for the audience to know what is the criteria in your mind for an MVP candidate? Like what must a player do for you in order for you to consider them someone who was in the running to be MVP? Uh, well, that's a really good question. But when it comes to MVP of the WNBA, I think something that I believe and value that not everyone necessarily considers when they're thinking about an MVP is to me, you really have to be either exceptional on just the offensive end, like exceptional, or in my opinion, you've got to impact both ends of the floor. Like I'm not nominating for someone for MVP just because you score a lot of points. Because then you could cross half court and go to the other side and give up those points you just scored. Um, so that's the first thing for me is you have to have an impact on both the offensive and defensive end of the floor, or you have to be elite offensively. Okay. The other thing that's kind of hard for me, or I would just put out there as something I do look at is a couple things, two things. One it's incredibly hard to be an MVP in this league if you don't finish in the top three teams. And actually, I do have a stat, and I hope I can find it, uh, where it hasn't happened very often that an MVP has been chosen for a team that's not in the upper echelon, meaning the top three finishers. Mm -hmm. So that would be another thing. I think you have to, again, be like head and shoulders above the competition for your team to finish fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, whatever, whatever that is, and get MVP. The last thing I would say that has become increasingly hard in recent years is that it's tough for players that have multiple MVP candidates on one team. And I say that because your job is easier the better the people around you are performing. Right. Mm -hmm. So the more support you have, the better your team, which was the thing I just talked about a little bit. Mm -hmm. But and, and the better the players are around you, obviously, the better you're going to be. Maya Moore was really, really good. Maya Moore was also really, really good because she had Simone and Syl and uh, Lindsay Whalen and Rebecca Brunson. Right. You could say the same for each of those individual players. So I'll stop there. But those are three things that to me are some of the separators as I start to think about the MVP race. Okay. So I have a stat for you too, which is actually kind of in line with what you just mentioned. So over the last five years, the MVP of the league has been the leading score on the top team for the last five years. So if we were to end the season today, based on that stat, the MVP of the league would most likely be Kalia Copper from the Chicago Sky as the as the MVP. 
right? And I don't know if, and I know, right? Chicago was the top team in the league and Kalia Copper is the leading scorer on the Chicago sky. So per that stat, if that were to hold true today, she would be the MVP. And that's just based on how it has happened. Not necessarily um, that that's, you know, realistically what would happen, but I do want to share this. Now we don't usually talk betting or anything on this show, but I think it's fair to put in perspective when we talk about MVP candidates, according to DraftKings, the odds right now of who would be leading the MVP race would be Asia Wilson, Brianna Stewart, Kelsey Plum, Sabrina Unescu, John Quill Jones, and then you have Arike, Candice, L. Um, I'm sorry, Elena Deladon, Jackie Young, Tina Charles, Neka Agumake, and Skylar Diggis Smith with the furthest odds to win. I know the, the odds CFA, to win. This odds is odds not, to okay. win. Not yeah, the odds, the, the odds that they were winning. These this is as of July 27th, 2022. Now, again, we don't usually talk betting or things like that on the show, but I, I read that off because to your point, usually it is a player that is in one of the top three teams in the league. And I think that when we think about potential candidates, the first three that come to mind for most people is Asia Wilson, Brianna Stewart, and Kelsey Plum, right? And so also, you know, if we are, you and I, putting together a top five of, of candidates who we think would be uh, in, in the MVP conversation, the one name that I throw out that I think we differ on um, is Alyssa Thomas. So I know people out there are going to say, well, she's a Connecticut Sun fan, so obviously she's going to throw in a Sun player. But I think to your point, what has been missed about some players is people who are able to impact the game on more than one level. Last night, for example, you know, Alyssa Thomas scored her second triple double in a week. And the last thing that she scored on the last part of that triple double that she uh, that she gained was the scoring. Rebounds and assists is where she was making her mark in the game before even the scoring. And that's kind of been a thing for a person like Alyssa Thomas, who has continually showed that she can impact the game in so many different ways on a comeback season. And yet, you know, I don't think that she's someone who has seriously been put into the MVP conversation. I think sometimes we kind of fall into this trap of, you know, these are the names we know. These are the people that we know. These are the teams that we know. And so instantly kind of like a LeBron syndrome where LeBron James is such an astounding player that you could almost put him in the MVP conversation every single year because of what he's able to do, right? I feel that way sometimes about Asia Wilson. And I feel sometimes that way about Brianna Stewart because they're so impactful on their teams every single year that I feel every year you can make a case for them being the MVP. What I want to see is how do we make a case and how do we see other players that are impacting their teams and that are MVPs of their teams, given that same consideration when it comes to the overall WNBA. I am, I'm fine with Alyssa Thomas being an MVP candidate. Um, my comment to you was, is she in your top five? Because when people say who's in the conversation, to me, the conversation is not 10 people long. Like to, at this point, you're trying to put a whole WNBA team, a starting lineup and a backup team in the MVP conversation. Like that's just, we're not doing that. So the fact that she is in your top five, then that's great. Then my next question to you was, then who else is in your top five? Oh, I will share my top five. So my top five is Brianna Stewart. Not, not in any, any particular order. So don't y'all come for me, y'all. Um, but my top five is Brianna Stewart, um, Asia Wilson, Alyssa Thomas, um, Kelsey Plum and Neka Agumake. Oh, yeah, I said Alyssa. Yeah, and Neka Agumake. That's my. So top you five. mean to tell me that Skylar Diggins Smith isn't in your top five? Why and I'm okay with that. Blast? I'm just asking. Why are you trying to put me on blast? And well, I'm, and I'm, I'm only saying blast. that because but no, I will no. tell you why. I will. Go ahead. She's not in my. She's not in my top five. She, okay. If. I, I don't have a top 10, but if I had a top 10, she would absolutely be in my top 10. There are no Scoring top 10s. Alone. But there are no top 10s. It's but there, but you're right. There are no top 10s. And so as much as I would love from performance only to put Skylar in my top 10, the overall play of Phoenix is why I can't. I mean, in, in my top five, the overall play of Phoenix is why I can't. Okay. All right. So with that being said, I'm fine with Alyssa being in your top five. She's not in my top five, but I understand her being in yours. And 
She's only not in my top five because I feel like my top five are really strong. I want to go back to that criteria and add one thing to that list of three. So the three things mm -hmm. I talked about is you have to be able to impact the defensive end unless you're extremely great offensively, right? If your team does not finish in the top three, it's going to be extremely hard, right? Mm -hmm. I talked about that. Teams that have multiple MVP candidates, it's tough because you're going to be better with better players around you. My last mm -hmm. thing that I would say is if you miss significant amount of the season, it's going to be tough for me. Whether you're arriving late into the WNBA or like Elena Deladon has had to sit out because Elena Deladon has been beautiful as of recent. It would be hard for me to put her in the top five uh, MVP because she missed significant time. And I, I can go back and crunch those numbers and I will, you know, once we have to go into voting, but off the top of my head, I wanted to put that out there too. With that being mm -hmm. said, my top five are Asia Wilson, in no particular order, Brianna Stewart, Kelsey Plum, Skylar Diggins Smith, and Neka Goon McKay. <clears throat> the reason why Skylar Diggins Smith makes my top five is because right now Phoenix is competing for a playoff spot. They are in the seventh spot. OK, they have maintained and been in the conversation at that seventh spot without Brittany Griner, without Tina Charles, and now mm -hmm. without Diamond Dish Shields. OK, the fact that, you know, Diana Taurasi has had her moments. Sophie Cunningham offensively has been better than expected in the small ball system. But there is no way that Phoenix is in the top eight without Skylar Diggins-Smith being an MVP night in and night out, okay? She's doing things no one else is in the league is doing when you look at the numbers. So that's the only difference between my list and your list right now is that I absolutely love Alyssa Thomas, don't think she gets the credit she deserves, but Skylar edges her out for me because Phoenix is in the playoff picture right now because of her. So I can totally respect that. Like that is, Skylar has the numbers statistically. And I don't, I, I honestly don't see how she's not dub, like averaging a double double every night, honestly, because the way that they've been able to move and create space for her to find players and get the assist that she does, as well as scoring 28 and 30, like it, it's phenomenal, right? So I get it. I really truly do get it. But where you and I agree on criteria is, there was so much that was happening with this Phoenix team throughout the course of the year that honestly, if they were playing now the way that they were playing at, I'm sorry, if they were playing at the beginning of the year, the way they were playing now, I think they may be higher up in seeding, but because they aren't, it's difficult for me to look at a player whose team is not one of the top teams in the league and think that that player could be the MVP. And that is no shade to Skylar. Again, amazing. But I just think the timing is just wrong in terms of the overall play of the team this season. That's well, you it. Said conversation. Other she ain't got to be. But yeah. again, I go back to, I don't see anyone outside of the top three teams making it unless you're exceptional. And to me, this year, Skylar has been exceptional. But moving along to your yeah. Twitter, moving along to your Twitter, the other thing you threw out here that I want to clarify <laughs> only for language purposes is the conversation around Courtney Vandersloot mm -hmm. and if she is underrated. I believe that Courtney Vandersloot is underappreciated. Okay. I don't, I think, I don't think we talk about her enough. She is exceptional. Okay. She will mm -hmm. obliterate the assist record by the time she is out of the WNBA. Mm -hmm. I think she is building a Hall of Fame resume, okay? She's about 75% there. Other 25% may come she wins another championship this year and has a performance like she did last year. Is she a future Hall of Famer? Like, can we say, Cordy Vandersloot, future Hall of Famer? No. And I know that's how you feel. I only use that term for people that we know are going into the Hall. Simone Augustus is a future Hall of Famer. Sue Bird is a future Hall of Famer. Sylvia Fowles is a future Hall of Famer. Candace Parker is a future Hall of Famer. Not there with Sloop. Building a Hall of Fame mm. resume? Absolutely. Okay. So I will, I me, will have the floor. Let me add some context to this. So there was a tweet in which a fan wrote that they believe that um, 
Courtney Vandersloot was underrated. And I replied to that tweet by saying, I don't believe that she's underrated. I think that she's properly rated. And so for me, when I hear the term underrated, I think someone who not only gets the recognition that she deserves, not only like that people don't really even know that the capabilities are there. For example, um, you hear people say that certain players are underrated passers or underrated rebounders. And that may be because they have a skill set where they are known to do one thing, but they do something else well and don't get the recognition for doing that other thing that they do well. So underrated makes sense in that term. I don't think anything about Clarendon Vandersloot is underrated. I think people know that she's the beast. I think people know that what she's capable of and her ability. And I think that she's properly rated. Now, underappreciated, very much so. Understood that. But underrated, no. However, I think Courtney Vandersloot has indeed done enough to be considered. And, and she's not good. Like, I don't think Courtney Vandersloot is about to be done with her career. Like, I think she still has several years left to play. But I think she's built a resume in which the Hall of Fame would consider. Now, this could either be A, the Hall of Fame has lowered their standards, and I ain't saying they did that, but I'm just simply saying when you look at, I ain't saying that. I'm not saying it. Don't look at me. I like mean, that. you just, I'm not saying but, that. But you almost I'm just, just countered your whole you look, argument by saying, no, she's I'm the, not saying she's that. Because they lowered their no, standards. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, I think that over the course of time, because we've seen this on the men's side as well, but I think that over the course of time, what we have considered to be Hall of Fame talent has differed. What people have considered to be Hall of Fame talent has differed. And I think it's more than just rings. I think it's more like, granted, I think rings should count because Hall of Fame for me is absolutely a personal accomplishment. So I do think rings should count. But I think that there has been a difference in what one has considered the criteria to be a Hall of Famer. And when I look at the point guard and the, the guard position, I won't even say point guard. When I look at the guard position, there are names that automatically come to mind with that position. And for me, Courtney Vandersloot is one of them. And with that, I think that when her career is done, she will be in the Hall of Fame. And so that's why I comfortably used the term future Hall of Famer. That's I, I, I understand that you are... I understand the terms in which you're using it. I will just say that I've never heard it used in that in that way pending the rest of their career go well. Um, most of the time when we use that phrase, it is someone who we know is going into a Hall of Fame, like hands down, not like if they continue on this track they're on, period. Because I agree I with it. you. If she continues on the track she's on, yeah, Absolutely. Today, can I say future Hall of Fame according events Vince Luke? Can't necessarily say that. I will say, I agree with you also in that the criteria needs to be checked a little bit. First of all, let's just, we're just getting women like consistently in there from the WNBA, which is great. Like multiples, right? Yeah. Yeah. Shout out to my girl Swin Cash going in, who is, ugh, love Swin. Yes. But the example maybe that would be similar to Courtney Vandersloot is, is Tisha Panichero in the Basketball Hall of Fame? I don't think she is. She right? She's won. She won one championship. She, you know, no. Her, she's to me the she's the best passer in the history of the league. I won't say she's the best point guard necessarily. She is the best passer in the history of the WNBA. This is with all people considered. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that would be a similar case where it's like, do I think Tisha be, should be in there? I do. But it's more from just, a holistic perspective because the hall does have contributor recognitions, right? Mm -hmm. So when it comes to the building blocks of the WNBA, how the popularity got to it, where it did the recognizable names who built, Tisha's got to be there. So yeah. that would be, I, I understand what you're saying in that the criteria definitely has to be evaluated. All right, what else, T? I'm done pinning you to the wall at this point. So what else? Okay, listen, this is what we do, people. LaChina and I, she always we, coming for we me. We do always. this, we do this <laughs> when we text each other, when we talk. So I'm like, this is what we need to bring to the show because yeah, we we go back and forth. So let's let's do it. 
this is what we do. This is what we do. Um, but as we continue on, um, you know, I know that you and I wanted to at one point kind of talk about some of the teams that we did not get to mention um, in our last episode in which we discussed the possibility of making a playoff push. And one team that you specifically mentioned that I was very interested in hearing your take on was the New York Liberty. And considering mm. that Sabrina UNESCO went out. <laughs> I mean, went out um, in her in, in in yesterday's or in last night's um, performance. I'm curious as to, you know, when you think about the teams that are on the outside looking in and just to give, you know, our, our fans a little bit of an update on where our standings are currently. Um, you know, the top four has not changed. Chicago, Las Vegas, Connecticut, and the Washington Mystics. Uh, Seattle is still sitting at the five spot. And all five of those teams have clinched their spot for the WNBA playoffs. But six is now Dallas. Seven is now Phoenix. And eight is the New York Liberty. Hello, Liberty. <laughs> so um, I just, I'm curious to get your take on whether or not you know, New York can stay in this eight spot. Um, and two, for them to stay in this eight spot, what do they need to do? So first of all, shout out to Sandy Brondello, who I think has done an exceptional job with the New York Liberty over time. But that, that always depends on what week you were going to ask me, because that's what I would say about the New York Liberty is that there's some times where I'm like, yes, Liberty's going to make the playoffs. And there's some time I'm like, Liberty just need to hit the showers early or they're going to need Benajah Laney to come back and save them. So, you know, it's huge that they're in that window right now. And um, in that eighth spot, which they'll try to hang on to their next few games are against LA at home. LA is. I almost have to take back everything I said about LA last week on the show. I'm out. There were two things. I was wrong about two things. And this is why I shouldn't coach because <laughs> as soon as things go south, I will give up on you real quick. Like <laughs> I'm, I'm leaving, I'm leaving LA that prediction. I said, Dallas, you know, they needed to get their act together or I said they were out. I think I said they were out. You Dallas were out. is thriving. So I'm sorry, y'all. I need to <laughs> swap those two teams. But anyway, depending on what week you ask me, Liberty's in or out. They play against LA at home, probably a win. Um, they're going to play at Phoenix, which I do think will be tough because Phoenix is so good in Phoenix and their crowds have been incredible. They're going to play mm -hmm. at Dallas twice in a row. And then they're going to play against the dream and uh, against the dream twice. Mm -hmm. So this schedule is interesting to me for a couple reasons for New York. Um, I think they'll beat LA. They're going to struggle with Phoenix. Dallas back to back in Dallas almost depends on if Dallas is still fighting for something or not. Right. Like, is there an issue with them either being in the playoff race or not? Or are they fighting for something position wise, which I don't even know what's still possible for Dallas at this point, but I'm pretty sure they can still, we got a note from, from our researcher, Jenny, shout out to Jenny. Um, but I'm pretty sure that as of Let's see. I'll tell you one second. Okay. So as of a day ago, Dallas's highest possible finish was third and lowest was 11. So if you're still playing for, and I know the odds of those things happening, we don't know, but if you're still playing for a top four spot, it could po possibly host, then you're going balls to the wall. Those last few games, no pun intended. Sorry. No, sorry. I didn't mean balls to the wall. Sorry. Um, <laughs> but then you're really, you know, putting your all into that and you're at home. So that's good too. Same for Atlanta. Like, what position? I think Atlanta's going to be scratching and clawing when they play New York in those back to back games because they're going to play at home against New York. Then they go to New York for the final game. So, I don't love this schedule for New York because of the desperation I know they will face with some teams that will also be scrapping to get in. However, mm -hmm. shout out to the performance of Sabrina. Honshu has been a pleasure mm -hmm. to watch right? Mm -hmm. um, they've had some pieces and some players that, you know, have, have stepped up, have played well. Um, and, and again, it's one of those teams that, you know, Natasha Howard, depending on how she plays, like when she's limiting her turnovers and when they're, you know, defending, they're a really good team. 
but it just depends on what happens. And, you know, Crystal Dangerfield has been a good addition. Marine Johannes, I know, hasn't been as hot from three, but, you know, Sammy Witt comes hot and cold. Comes down to two mm-hmm. things for me. Are they defending and are they hitting threes? That's that's basically it for me when it comes to New York. I think they were 11 of 26 last night, and it's not necessarily the percentage of threes. It's the number of threes. It's not the percentage of what they hit, which they hit it. So I think you and I both, um, you know, before we close out this show, I think you and I both have some yeses and nos and rights and wrongs to admit, because I definitely was one who counted New York out or like automatically. I was like, they're not going to do it. But my right was, I did say that as well as, or as the potential that Los Angeles had, it's going to be tough. And I think another team is going to be the reason why they fall out. And sure enough, um, they fallen out. They have, they were literally just in, in the eight spot yesterday and then losing to New York, losing against teams that they more than likely should win. When you look at what's statistically on paper, when you look at matchups, these are games that you would think that they should win, um, but they didn't. And so right in or wrong, right? I was thinking that it would be Minnesota and Minnesota for all, you know, for all things that matter. I'm not saying that they do. Remember, I've been saying this all year. I ain't going to count out Cheryl Reeve, right? But I'm scared because this is Seal's final season and it would break my heart if if, if for this final season, Seal don't make it to the playoffs. But here's the thing though, T. I actually am now a believer in Minnesota. And I don't love their schedule, right? They're going to play at Seattle. Mm -hmm. They play the dream at home. But then they have to play, they have to win at Phoenix. They got to beat Seattle at home. And then they got to win at Connecticut. Like those, I'm not saying they have to win all those games, but they kind of need to win all those games. But I actually think that the biggest threat to the New York Liberty making it based on the standings right now with them being in eighth place is the Minnesota Lynx. Because, honey, they blew into Atlanta. And let me tell you, that Ariel Powers... Okay, uh, Mariah mm-hmm. Jefferson, that's Sylvia mm-hmm. Fowles. Is she still leading the league in rebounding at 36 years old right now? Is she? Like, Sylvia what Fowles. is really what is really happening? Sylvia Fowles, let us know at All-Star Game, she still got it. She wasn't playing with y'all. Period. <laughs> so, so anyway, I, I, I actually think, and this is going to be, <laughs> listen, me and Tariqa are going to be saying things, taking it back. The saying things, taking it back. We reserve the right to do that on this podcast. And I do think Minnesota <laughs> is going to make the playoffs. I don't know how, but count well, it. we have a couple of more matchups on our uh, ESPN air this week. Um, tomorrow, Phoenix and Connecticut will be on ESPN. Your girl of China is calling that game. So make sure you check that out. Um, there's a matchup between Chicago and Connecticut on Sunday that I believe is also on ESPN. Um, so there's a lot going on um, this week that will determine seating, that will determine placement. Like just because these teams have clinched, um, I would hate to be the person to have to be in that four or five matchup. That's a scary matchup. Yes, because as we have talked about home court advantage, just so we make clear right now, and I know we've got to go, we've got to wrap, but let me say this real quick. Tariq and I just talked about the playoff format. No more single elimination, no more buys. Everyone Mm -hmm. plays in the first round. It's best of three, Mm -hmm. but the first two games are on the higher seeded team's floor. So you may not even make it to game three if you're that lower seed. You got to win two road games in a row to even have a shot at the house. So that's the interesting part, which I think is probably cost related. When I, I would love to see a one, one, one format instead of a two, one format, but I'm sure it has to do with the cost of trying to send everybody back and forth. So, and I do want to say there's a double header on Sunday, actually on ABC, Connecticut at Chicago, Vegas at Seattle. Yes. So Fans, be sure to check those things out. Um, it has been a fun show as always. You know where you can continue to find us. I am at She Knows Sports. LaChina is at LaChina Robinson. You can definitely holler at us at Around the Rim Pod on Twitter or send us an email at Around the Rim Podcast at gmail.com. And we will see you guys next week. And can I just say that next Wednesday when we record, it's my birthday. So y'all might want to come correct with Oh, Leo season, baby. Somebody it's- better get her (laughs) do something okay leo season leo energy all day bye guys bye